briefly tell me who you are. I am Seth Kumi, uh, the outgoing director of UMIS Political Affairs Division, UMIS, the United Nations Mission in South Sudan. So just in a few words, where are we now in South Sudan on, uh, in terms of the security and political situation? Well, both are complex. Uh, the political situation is complex. Mm, we are currently as having uh, a transitional government of national unity that was established under the peace agreement that was concluded in uh, August 2015. But unfortunately, in July 2016, there was a conflict mm, between the president and the, uh, what I would say, the bodyguards of the president and the former vice president. So there was a transition. The former vice president was forced to leave town and his uh, minister for minerals became the new leader of the uh, armed opposition. So we are now split. Uh, those outside the country do not recognize, the opposition forces outside the country do not recognize uh, the current transitional government of national unity. And so there is now an attempt to revitalize the whole peace agreement that was concluded in 2015 to bring new stakeholders, new actors that have come into place uh, uh, since the July crisis. And with all the efforts towards peace, the security situation still doesn't seem to be improving. In fact, as we enter the dry season, it seems to be getting worse. Yes, uh, it's not uh, really. There have been engagement uh, between pockets, not serious military type of confrontation. This has skirmishes, but the skirmishes are normally very dangerous for people who are civilians because it creates a lot of insecurity and they've been confined mainly outside Juba to the margins of the border areas between Uganda and Ethiopia. And so these border areas are where we see most of the fighting. Then also in the unity state where the forces of the former first vice president and the current first vice president have been having some skirmishes. So it has created a sense of insecurity, especially when you don't have control over those forces. They are not both are. You have so many loose military uh, engagements that there's no central control. You know all the political movers and shakers. Can you think of one person or a group of people who are going to turn this situation around? I think all the political leaders, those who fought in the Liberation War, uh, these were people who fought for nothing. They sacrificed, but they had a common enemy, that is Sudan. So when they gained independence, the institutional structures of a modern state were totally absent. They didn't have a national army. They didn't have uh, a national identity. They didn't have national institution, particularly the judiciary. So uh, the power struggle among the political elite, uh, they were not able to manage their diversity well. So this is what the key political figures, from the president, uh, who was, uh, became the leader of the SPLM and SPLA after the death of John Garan in 2000, to all the members of the political bureau, and uh, the leaders of the SPLA. So they all have to come together to place the interest of South Sudan above their own. Can, do you think they'll do that? Uh, do, do we have the right leaders in place to do that? They don't have any option. They are South Sudanese and this is their country. It's and not uh, a very positive uh, no, they, position. No, it's, it, it gets to, for me, I see they've run out of options. <clears throat> and they just, uh, South Sudan can't have this brand name it's such a name that is synonymous with conflict, with destruction, with corruption, and then expect foreign investors. There is more, this is a modern era where we, the global system is uh, interdependent. And if you are not ready to participate in the global economy, how are you going to help your people? And being head of state, uh, being a leader, it also entails some responsibilities. And they have a, a responsibility to their own people. You've been in this country, well, South Sudan and previously Sudan for, is it now 11 years? Exactly, 11 years. Does anything surprise you about South Sudan uh, after all that experience here? 
No, one thing that I've argued over and over is that there is nothing like South Sudan exceptionalism. That the conflict in South Sudan is not unique to South Sudan alone. And I, sometimes when I, I take my intellectual roots from history, so I go back as far as uh, the history of the Peloponnesian War written by Thucydides. When Athens and Spartan fought, they also had a common enemy, Persia. When Persia was removed, there was envious of the among the leaders competition. So they fought. What is different from the current crisis? Sudan was no longer the common enemy. They fought among themselves. They were not able to manage the political struggle and the infighting for political power. This conflict is essentially a struggle for political power. That and money. Well, every in, in African politics, uh, politics is the only, I would say, the most significant source of wealth. So if you are fighting for political power, it's fighting over the control over the nation's resources. The question that I keep asking myself that I've been here is that why don't they all fight uh, to establish their own parties and sell the economic or political agenda on how they can bring the country together? Uh, what are the integrative mechanisms for providing uh, a national identity? How are they going to rebuild an economy that is, has been shattered completely? So. The question is, why are they now fighting to lead the SPLM? Because it is the Liberation Party, and in Africa, Liberation Parties don't leave power easily. You're, you're a big advocate for South Sudan. Why is that? Because I believe South Sudan will rise again. And this country has tremendous human and natural resources. Look at the land that has not been uh, cultivated. And now we have, what, Category 5? Phase five, I don't know how the uh, humanitarians call it, people who are hungry. When do you have one of the most youthful populations, the average age for South Sudan is 17. It's one of the most youthful countries in the world. Uh, you have a very educated population. And then you also have natural resources, minerals, oil, water, all these natural resources are there. The only thing that is missing is peace. And that is the missing link. And I believe ultimately they will have peace. The political leaders have hit rock bottom. There's nothing more they can do but to be responsible and take uh, uh, responsibilities for their actions and bring South Sudan back to the uh, durable peace. Then they will unlock all the potentials, human and natural resources. And that's why I'm, I'm optimistic. What disappoints you about South Sudan? It's the leaders. I'm, these are people who fought for nothing to liberate their country from Arab colonial rule. Then why are they practicing the same sort of, why are they fighting among themselves for power? When uh, they, they see that we have what, 2.1 million people who have been displaced from their own country, a country that sought independence. Then we have one point and um, 1.8 million who are internally displaced, including what, 215,000 in the UN camps. This is a huge human resource that is not being used. And we're spending, remember, we're spending, um, because of all this humanitarian crisis, the humanitarians are asking for $1.8 billion. And how much, you know the budget of South Sudan, 300 million. So if you see it, the humanitarian budget alone is six times the national, the, uh, the national budget. And where are these humanitarian going? They're not going to the productive sectors of the economy. You're well known um, in the political scene here. Uh, you're in and out of the ministries all the time. Everyone knows you. Do, you do, do you tell those leaders that you're disappointed with them? Yes, behind the scenes. And what's their reaction? Have you told the president that? No, I've not met the president uh, since uh, 2013. And uh, that was in a, a group setting. So what South Sudanese are, uh, are people who are very, very friendly and warm when you meet them one and one. Uh, today I met the Minister of Information, uh, Honorable Michael Makui. I call, always call, refer to him as my senior brother. Anytime I go, we have our disagreement. I go behind the scenes and tell him, uh, honorable, this should not have been done. And I always, whenever I meet them, I said, I said, I make a joke about them. I said, if you people cannot rule, shall we bring the British back? 
And I've made this point to you sometimes and you what, laugh. And what do they say? Do they think that's a good idea? I've made this uh, privately. If you can rule, let us bring the British back. We will solve your problem. You say we will solve it in our Sudanese way. And I believe that. And, and, and they, they laugh at that. Presumably they like it. They laugh. And I've made it. I said the options are very simple. If you cannot manage this independence that you fought hard for it, let us outsource it. The British were there. They ruled South Sudan with what? 100 British troops, the whole of the United Sudan. And what? The SPLA is what? 240,000. So what we need to do is to start building a nation state and have to manage two things that they have to do well now. They first have to manage diversity. South Sudan has what, 64 ethnic divisions. And they have to create a national identity from that 64, not re with a recourse to conflict or authoritarian rule, but they have to get all South Sudanese to see whether they want to live together as one nation and what should be the overriding national identity. You, what we need now are leaders who will place. They don't, I don't think those leaders are visionless. They all are visionary leaders, but they've not been able to put their personal interest aside and let the interests of South Sudan be the overriding uh, one. You leave the mis mission as the director of the political affairs division. What do you think your biggest achievement has been since you've been here? I would say my biggest achievement is that I've been able to build a team uh, through my colleagues are astounding that we have learned the culture and our engagement has been people engagement. You know, I trained as a, as a political science international relations theorist. And then I got into the field, had to do away with all these theories and become a practitioner. And I think every day I learn something new. And one thing that I've learned is how to engage people, how to get the best out of people. This is what I do with my team. And also how to appeal. And when I meet my South Sudanese counterpart, they, you may you say that I'm popular. I'm popular because I always appeal to them at their strongest. I always get the best out of them. That's why when you're, I'm a, you're, you're tough with them, yeah? Yes. And they, and they appreciate that. And they appreciate that. And that's what, when I gave, when Ebony Center through, uh, asked me to give my farewell speech, the commentary were that I come behind the scene and I'm very, very tough on them. Say, so you can do this. You can do this. You can destroy this country like that. You have to see. And you can just be going around. We also have to show that we have the responsibility towards our own citizens. Do you have any personal regrets as you move towards retirement in terms of the job you've done here? Not at all. I think I've done the best I could with the resources that I have. And um, um, my only regret that um, no, I'm leaving South Sudan when uh, this cried, the economy is not booming. When at the time of independence, South Sudan's GDP was three times that of its neighbors. But now, when, I, uh, when they gained independence, the, South Sudan pound was one to two to one US dollar. I'm living now and the pound is eight, uh, 180 to one US dollar. So you could see that if you were, mm, uh, uh, you were earning like 180, that means you are earning uh, one dollar. So I see people's quality of life, standard of living has drastically fallen. And I believe that they have to come back, become part of the international community, have tradable commodities that they will be able to sell to bring the world. Their greatest assets is not the oil, it's their human resource. And they have to start a process where they, what are the integrative mechanisms available to the political leaders. First, they have to place the interests of the country above their own, establish peace, an inclusive political process, then unlock the potential, a very good educational system, hospitals, or do an infrastructure to link communities. This is my dream for South Sudan, and I have, I'm very convinced in my heart that they'll be able to achieve this. So you're just about to retire. What happens next week if you get a call from the president's office and he wants you to come back as a, as a senior advisor? How would you react to that? I think I'll take it and I'll tell the president now I can talk to you behind the scene. And that I don't need to be a UN official with a, a card on all the restrictions. And I will talk 
to him and say, you have, how do you want to be remembered? As somebody who built the economy and whether history will be kind to you. And I'll look him in the eye and say, Mr. President, let history recognize you as the one who was able to bring durable peace to South Sudan. The one who was able to place the interest of the country above everybody, above uh, yours, and then you were able to bring peace. And then that is what history will remember you for, and not, not the battles that you won. Is there anything you could say to him as, a, as an independent person that you couldn't say to him as a UN official? A lot, I don't think I... Uh, what I would still say is that the political elite should come together, and I believe there is no military solution to this current conflict. And my reasons are um, that I take my route from history. If I look at all conflicts that have been fought since the, uh, his, uh, the b battle between Athens and Sparta, the history of that, uh, Tosidis wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, there is no military solution. This is a country that is devoid of infrastructure. <clears throat> Remember, in all battles, you have to be able to move troops. So they would not, there is not going to be any outright military victory. What they have to learn and know is that let history be their guide. Let them look back into history and look further and say that, hey, guys, let, and I think the president is doing that, to be fair. With, uh, I have my own reflections about as I go. There have been a lot of uh, reconciliatory moves uh, from the uh, from the president uh, in the terms of the revitalization which I'm following very closely uh, they have agreed to all the proposals that have come in the 16 points that the IGAD um, uh, the 16 points are key areas where they are going to argue is argue so I, I believe that they are South Sudanese they fought for their country they we can't claim that we love South Sudanese more than they love themselves. And we shouldn't think that people, they love their country, they love themselves. So what we need to help them is to find a South Sudanese solution to the current crisis, not an imposition. You're going back to Ghana, you're going to your farm. Yes. How, how do you intend to keep up with what's happening here? <laughs> Through rumors? <laughs> Maybe, no, seriously, I will still have my and now we reach a technological age where we can easily get access to information. And uh, I will not be on the UN website, but I still will be in touch with some of the key uh, stakeholders in South Sudan. On my farm, I, I'm going to grow cocoa and I don't eat chocolate. I think I'm going to, and this is some of the terms of trade that we would like to see change. The average cocoa farmers uh, take, uh, cocoa industry is a multi, $150 billion all chocolate, and then farmers get less than $2 billion. So I think I, now I'm going to be an, uh, one of the activist farmers, not to grow a big cocoa farm, be engaged in more <laughs> activism. In the, in the and how to change of cocoa. <laughs> how to, yeah, how to fight for the average cocoa farmer using all the skills of mediation and uh, resolution that I learned in the UN. I think I, I would do fine. Seth, thanks very thank much. You it's well, been a pleasure thank you to work well, with you. Thank you it's been a great much. experience. Thank I you. hope I uh, will get it. That my parting remarks are that South Sudanese need one thing, and it's hope that they will recover again. There is no position that is permanent. This current situation will not be permanent. They will recover. And next time we're talking again, it will be what a great country South Sudan is. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.